our top story tonight, which running backs are actually going to be starting in 2023? Because there is a whole lot of hype for a whole bunch of different players. But who's actually going to have a role? Who's a starter? Spoiler alert, there is only one running back that's going to be a starter come week one. And then there's a bunch of committee backs. There's some backups. And then for the most part, there's a lot of guys that we're excited about. And they're going to start the season as the RB3 or just fighting for a spot on the roster. So let's get into it on Player Profiler today. Like I spoiled in the introduction, there is only one running back that is going to be starting come week one. And unless there's injuries, of course, that can always change. But as of today, based on the current roster constructions, Bijan Robinson is the only running back that will be the week one starter. It is. That's it. It's true. Bijan Robinson is going to be the lead back for the Atlanta Falcons. He'll be the third down back for the Atlanta Falcons. He'll be the goal line back in a lot of situations, though Tyler Algier will have some mix in as well. I saw an interesting tweet earlier today. What if the Falcons just decide to put in the most magnificent 31 personnel that we've ever seen? They have three running backs, one tight end, one receiver. So you line up Drake London out wide. You line up Cordero Patterson out wide. You can put Bijan Robinson in the slot and have Tyler Algier as the running back motion, move all these guys around. The things that the Atlanta Falcons can do with their personnel is going to be interesting. And Arthur Smith is one of the few coaches that has shown he is willing to mix and match his personnel group. So we'll still see some Tyler Algier. We'll still see some Cordero Patterson. But Bijan Robinson is the one running back that is a starter right now. Jameer Gibbs is close, but he's in a committee. And given the fact that David Montgomery is the lead back, the between the tackles grinders, the between the 20s ball carrier. David Montgomery is the starter. Jameer Gibbs will, maybe he does technically start week one, or maybe it's week two that he starts. It's going to change because this is a committee that the Detroit Lions will employ. Jameer Gibbs is not a full-time starter and is not expected to be a full-time starter this year. David Montgomery is going to mix in plenty He's going to have a lot of touchdowns, similar to Jamal Williams. He's probably not going to have 17 because that was a Lions record, but probably going to have more efficiency, going to have more receptions. David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs, this is a full-blown committee, probably 60-40 for David Montgomery. Maybe it ends up being 50-50. Maybe it changes throughout the course of the season, and it depends on game script. But either way, Jameer Gibbs is not a starting running back in the NFL. He's a committee back, just like Devon A. Chain. We expect Jameer Gibbs to have a much larger part of the committee than Devon A. Chain, but they are both still in a committee. Jameer Gibbs in a two-headed committee with David Montgomery and then Craig Reynolds and Jamar Jefferson. They'll fight for snaps behind those two. But Devon A. Chain is in a three-way competition between Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert. And that could all be thrown out the window if Dalvin Cook does indeed sign with the Miami Dolphins. We have heard reports that, yes, the Dolphins have offered Dalvin Cook. No, he has not signed yet because he does not deem their offer acceptable. So we're waiting. And maybe Devon A. Chain doesn't get Dalvin Cook in the backfield. But even if that's the case, it's still going to be a three-way committee. Devon A. Chain isn't going to see 50% of the opportunities of the Miami Dolphins backfield. That's just not going to happen. He'll be involved in the passing game. He'll have some explosive runs, but you're not going to see a 20 touch game from Devon A chain barring injuries. I don't expect that to happen. He'll be in a, a 15 touch a game type of guy in some games, but it's going to be a committee. They're going to ride the hot hand. Jeff Wilson continues to be the most underrated running back right now. As long as Dalvin Cook doesn't sign. Because Dalvin Cook signs, then it's over for Jeff Wilson. Over for Raheem Mostert. Over for Devon A. Chain. But right now, this is a full-blown committee. And if you want to dive into these committees, you want to dive into these players, the Player Profiler Draft Kit is right for you. Hey, it's the Podfather of great news. The 2023 Draft Kit is live. It is world famous. Why? Because it is the best 
resource for winning fantasy football championships that exists. There are rankings and cheat sheets for every format you can imagine. We have projections both at the team level and the player level. And wherever you are, you can click on a player, open them up, and see in-depth written analysis about what to expect in fantasy football from that player this year. And then you can click on the team, and you can get even more in-depth analysis, all the drivers of fantasy production, both in a positive and negative direction for that team, including a signature trend. And the graphics are incredible. So these team insights, they give you the team-level projections, the vacated targets, the vacated areas, and that one dynamic for each team that you need to know when making decisions on draft day. And we added a bunch of features. I mean, individual cheat sheets for Theo and Billy and Dario. So you could take your favorite analyst and download their personal draft cheat sheet. And then in the commissioner's section, also brand new this year, Memphis Young lays out everything you need to know to manage a league, do's, don'ts, tips, and what the more innovative fantasy commissioners are doing this year. That's presented by Trophy Smack. The whole package is presented by the Fantasy Football Players Championship, the FFPC, Ray Garvin, Derek Brown, the best minds in the industry contributing analysis. It's certainly not the most inexpensive draft kit on the market, but uh, <laughs> it is the best. Playerprofiler.com slash draft kit. Playerprofiler.com slash draft kit. Go get it. So we have covered the one starting running back out of this rookie class. We've covered the two running backs that, you know, they could technically start week one, but they're still a committee back. No way that they're going to dominate the touches early in their career. Still going to have a role. Then we've got the two committee backs that there's no chance that they actually start week one, barring an injury. And that is Tank Bigsby. And yeah, some people might think, yeah, well, Tank Bigsby, he's just the back of Travis Etienne's bell cow. I don't know about that. Based on what we saw from Doug Peterson last year, based on what we saw from Doug Peterson with the Philadelphia Eagles, I think this is a 60-40 split. Travis Etienne, he's still a bell cow, still sees that 60% threshold that I require to be considered a bell cow back, but it's closer to a committee. It's 60-40, you know, maybe we see 55-45. Maybe we see something a little bit closer. Either way. Tank Bigsby is going to get his. He's going to be the James Robinson. He's going to handle the in-between the tackles, touches, maybe see some of the goal line work too. Because that's just who the Jacksonville Jaguars are. That's how they view Travis Etienne. This is, unfortunately, a committee. And a committee that could include Jamichael Hasty and Dearness Johnson too. I don't expect it to. I think Jamichael Hasty is going to be the RB3 slash special teamer. Mix in... On some third downs, maybe, but not enough to take real targets away from Travis Etienne. Travis Etienne taking targets away from himself. He needs to improve in that regard, commanding targets. But Hanks Bigsby is going to have a role. He's not going to start week one. He might only see 30% of the snaps week one. But as the season goes on, Tank Bigsby is going to end up with about a 40% workload in this backfield. And in one of the most explosive offenses in the NFL. Jacksonville Jaguars, that's a good thing. And our final committee back that won't start week one is Roshan Johnson, though it won't be too long before Roshan is the starter for the Chicago Bears. Fourth round pick, usually fourth round picks don't get the week one start. I don't think even Damian Pierce was the week one starter this year. He was still technically in a committee to start the year. Actually, he might have started the game, but he, he didn't get a full workload. He was closer to a committee. He didn't see the receiving work that we would love like to see. We still saw too much Rex Burkhead, too much Dare Wale. But anyways, back to Roshan Johnson, fourth round pick, competing with Khalil Herbert. And Khalil Herbert, one of the most efficient runners in the NFL. The work he did on the ground is incredible. The work he did in yards per touch, I believe he is top six in yards per touch, is incredible because he is not a pass catcher. Yards per touch is a stat that skews towards receiving backs because receptions typically go more than rush yards. You typically average more yards per reception than more yards per rush. And so for Khalil Herbert to be as efficient as he is without being a pass catcher, that's impressive. Khalil Herbert is an impressive runner. Unfortunately, that's really all he has. There are three things you got to do as a running back in the NFL. Number one is run the football, but that's not actually 
number one. Not if you talk to the Chicago Bears. The Chicago Bears, the number one thing you got to do as a running back is protect the quarterback. Running the ball comes two. Protecting the quarterback is one, and that is something that Khalil Herbert has struggled in throughout his career. David Montgomery was a bell cow for this reason. They trusted him more on first downs, and Khalil Herbert wasn't good enough in the passing game to protect Justin Fields. And so it was just David Montgomery and on third downs. And that might be the case again this year. Maybe Khalil Herbert does keep the job as the lead back, the early down rusher on first down. But unless he takes a massive step forward, he will not be playing on third downs, which will in turn see him playing less second downs. When you're in second and long, they're going to put Roshan Johnson on the field. Because Roshan Johnson, phenomenal pass blocker at the University of Texas, something that we heard all throughout the offseason, what he did at the Senior Bowl, what he did at the Combine. Roshan Johnson is just that kind of guy that can command a locker room. And he's going to. He is going to be the starter for the Chicago Bears by Halloween at the latest. I think it'll be earlier, but Halloween at the very latest for Roshan Johnson. Because Dante Foreman's not a threat either. Dante Foreman can't pass block either. And Dante Foreman is a worse runner of the football than Khalil Herbert. So there are a lot of people that are excited about Dante Foreman. I am not one of them. Dante Foreman very well might be inactive on game days because Travis Homer did sign with the Chicago Bears. He signed for more guaranteed money. And Travis Homer plays on special teams. Dante Foreman doesn't play on special teams. Roshan Johnson will play on special teams, something he did at the University of Texas too because B. John Robinson was a star. That helps your case to be active on game day. So if Khalil Herbert is the starter and the two backups play special teams and the other backup doesn't, if they only go with three running backs, Dante Foreman is going to be the healthy scratch. And that will leave Roshan Johnson as the RB2 early before he becomes the RB1. But what about the players that are true backups? This is not a committee. Zach Charbonnet is not in a committee. This is Kenneth Walker's backfield. Kenneth Walker was drafted to be a lead back. He was drafted to be a bell cow. He showed it at times last year. Kenneth Walker is a damn good football player. Zach Charbonnet, he's solid. Seems like a great guy, but he was drafted to back up Kenneth Walker. He was not drafted to supplant him. He was not drafted to steal touches from Kenneth Walker. And even then, He might not be the number one backup. We talked about it plenty. DJ Dallas is going to surprise people how often he is used in the game. Kenny McIntosh could be a fixture on third downs at some point too. So if Zach Charbonnet is a worse runner than Kenneth Walker and a worse receiver than DJ Dallas and Kenny McIntosh, when does he see the field? It's going to be change of pace carries. That is who Zach Charbonnet is. He's a change of pace back for the Seattle Seahawks. Pure backup. Same. With Tajay Spears, though Tajay Spears could carve out a role independently, he is a true backup. This is not a committee with Derrick Henry and Tajay Spears. Tajay Spears can be good enough to be a backup that has some standalone value, especially because the receivers in Tennessee are not great, but Tajay Spears isn't going to be stealing touches from Derrick Henry. Tajay Spears will be earning touches on his own independently of Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry still going to see 70% of the opportunity. It's up to Tajay Spears to decide whether he's going to see 10% or whether he's going to see 30%. Tajay Spears back up with huge upside if anything does happen to Derrick Henry and his work in the receiving game does give him a little bit of standalone value, but he is a pure backup right now. And then there's the third stringers. There are some names that we are excited about that I don't think people have accepted are sitting at third string right now. Kendra Miller. People know Kendra Miller is the RB3. They know Alvin Kamara is the starter. They know Jamal Williams is the grinder. and He's going to be stealing some touchdowns. But I don't think it's really set in that Kendra Miller hasn't practiced with the Saints yet. So he is the RB3, but he hasn't gotten any reps at it he hasn't had any experience at it what we're banking on with Kendra Miller is the Alvin Kamara suspension and that he can push Jamal Williams and see more touches than him because he is an electric running back but as it stands today there is no suspension for Alvin Kamara 
Jamal Williams is the RB2. Kendra Miller is the RB3. And we're going to be monitoring practice throughout training camp. Is Kendra Miller practicing? When is he working off to the side? When is he working with the team? When is he cleared? Those are all questions that we don't have the answers to. And until then, Kendra Miller is a firm third running back for the New Orleans Saints. And then we've got some guys that are technically third running backs, but maybe not. Israel Abanacanda. He's the third running back behind Michael Carter and Bam Knight. But what happens if Brees Young actually does play week one? Is Israel Abanacanda the RB4? Would he be active on game days if that's the case? Maybe because they're worried about Brees Hall's knee. They'll carry four running backs on the roster to start the season. But Bam Knight was pretty good last year, both as a rusher and a receiver. Bam Knight impressed a lot of people. So could Israel Abanacanda really end up being the RB4 for the New York Jets? And what happens if they do sign Dalvin Cook, who they have been linked to, who they have been trying to recruit on a Super Bowl run? They would obviously cut Bam Knight at that point, and still Israel Abanacanda is the RB4. Not looking great for Israel Abanacanda in year one, unless Brees Hall misses significant time. And even then, he's part of a committee, and he's the third guy in in that committee. Chase Brown's the RB3 too for the Cincinnati Bengals. People want to act like he's the RB2. Some people want to act like uh, he's going to step in immediately and replace Samaj P. Ryan. But what evidence do we have for that other than he was drafted and they didn't sign anyone? Because they also re-signed Travion Williams, and they've been talking up him quite a bit, saying that he's going to get the first crack at the Samaj P. Ryan role. And then there's Chris Evans. I don't think that the Bengals actually like Chris Evans. I think Chase Brown's going to beat him out. But Chase Brown currently sitting as the RB3-4 behind Joe Mixon, behind Travian Williams, and competing with Chris Evans. And we know what Chase Brown did when competing against other high-level competition at the Senior Bowl didn't exactly stand out. Will that be the case for the Bengals' practices? Will he disappoint, and will he end up being the RB3 for the whole season? Potentially. Very potentially with Chase Brown. Chris Rodriguez locked in as the RB3 for the Washington Commanders for now. We know they've reached out to Kareem Hunt, and if that's the case, Chris Rodriguez will fall to RB4. And they could bring in another running back instead of Kareem Hunt. They could bring in Fournette. They could bring in Ezekiel Elliott. Either way, Chris Rodriguez is currently the RB4. He is not a threat to Antonio Gibson on third downs. He is not a receiving threat to Antonio Gibson. And I don't know. He and Brian Robinson are going to duke it out for the between the tackles role, a role that I just don't care about for fantasy football purposes. Then we've got Deuce Vaughn and Deuce Vaughn kind of works in his own independent role. And he's technically the RB four, but they're going to cut either Ronald Jones or Malik Davis. Well, sorry, they're probably going to cut Ronald Jones or they'll have Deuce Vaughn ahead of Ronald Jones. If an injury were to happen, Ronald Jones would play ahead of Deuce Vaughn. But if everyone is healthy, Tony Pollard, Malik Davis, Ronald Jones, and Deuce Vaughn, Deuce Vaughn's going to be the third running back in getting touches. Ronald Jones is just going to be the backup for backup's sake. But Deuce Vaughn, new Darren Sproles, going to have his own role. And our final backup, or third string, sorry, is Zach Evans. Zach Evans, he could end up being in a committee behind Cam Akers. Cam Akers is going to be a bell cow. Cam Akers is going to see 60 plus percent of the opportunity. Cam Akers is going to be a workhorse for the Los Angeles Rams. It's just how many touches behind him go to what player. Kyron Williams going to be fighting for some of those touches. Didn't do particularly good last year. Not an athlete. Zach Evans, more athletic, but still not a hyper athlete that we expected him to be. He's a little bit smaller than we expected. And then there's Sony Michelle. Sony Michelle, the ever reliable, steady hand. If Zach Evans can't beat out Sony Michelle and Kyron Williams, Bad sign early in his NFL career. And then there's the guys that aren't going to matter in 2023. I'm sorry. I'm especially sorry to Bradley Stalder, Dwayne McBride. He's competing to be the RB3, the RB2, the RB1, whatever. It's not going to matter. Alexander Madison is going to play enough. He's going to see 50% of the touches. Then Ty Chandler will be the backup some weeks. Kenan Wong will be the backup some weeks. Dwayne McBride will be the backup. And by backup, there will be weeks where Alexander Madison isn't leading in touches for the Minnesota Vikings. They'll go to a more hot hand approach. 
Dwayne McBride's just a little bit farther back in there. I am not in on him. Evan Hall, another player that is competing, but he's competing behind Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor's going to have majority of that work. Zach Moss is kind of the Sony Michelle where he's just a reliable backup. And then there's Deion Jackson. Evan Hall's got to beat out Deion Jackson too. I think down the road, Evan Hall can be an electric satellite back for the Indianapolis Colts. But when you've got a quarterback who's not going to check it down and you're playing behind Jonathan Taylor, I don't expect much from you in year one. Don't expect much from Eric Gray either. Saquon's going to play. He's not going to hold out. Even if he did hold out, Matt Breida, Gary Brightwell, Jay Sean Corbin, they would all see reps as well alongside Eric Gray. It's a committee. NFL teams are heading to more committees. When you don't have a dominant back, when you lose to Dalvin Cook and replace him with an Alexander Madison, you're going to head to a committee. If Saquon Barkley doesn't play, <laughs> Matt Breida going to play, what, 40% of the snaps, Eric Gray 30%, Gary Brightwell 20 I don't know. It's going to be an absolute mess, but it's not going to matter for fantasy football, even if there is an injury. Same with Lou Nichols. Lou Nichols backing up Aaron Jones, backing up A.J. Dillon. Has to beat out Patrick Taylor, which is very possible, but Lou Nichols wasn't anything special in college, and now he's behind two backs where if A.J. Dillon wasn't there, Aaron Jones would be a bell cow, and if Aaron Jones wasn't there, A.J. Dillon would be a bell cow. So, unfortunately, this running back class, there's a lot of names, a lot of names that are going to disappoint in 2023. Hey, you like that video, be sure to subscribe and activate those alerts so you get notified as soon as new videos drop. And be sure to check out playerprofiler.com. We have all the tools for you to dominate every type of fantasy league. We have a draft kit, Dynasty Deluxe, Data Analysis, DFS Dominator, and don't forget the player rankings to rule them all.